Hey, good morning, Mercy family. Good morning. Man, hey, I want to take a second and thank uh, so many of you for joining us Wednesday night, uh, both at Providence Road and at Northeast for our uh, night of prayer and worship. It was one of the most powerful things I've been a part of uh, at our church. It was uh, amazing. You showed up. Spirit of God showed up. Don't know how else to say it. I think it's most people we've had at like a non-Sunday morning gathering, but above and beyond that, it was a powerful time of testimony. Um, that was so encouraging. It was a time of people coming to the altar and laying their burdens down, confessing sin. We heard reports of a couple people that were healed uh, coming and asking for prayer over that. And I believe, above all, God was glorified by us expressing our dependence on him. Um, and I'll tell you, the party continues today because uh, today we have baptisms at both of our campuses. Praise God for that. Yeah. Great week in our church. Uh, this past Wednesday was also um, Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of a season in the church calendar, the Christian calendar. It's the beginning of a season called Lent, L-E-N-T, all right? Um, it's the 40 days, marks the 40 days leading up to Easter, and the idea of Lent is to focus our hearts on the need that we have for the victory that Christ wins in his resurrection that we celebrate on Easter Sunday. The way we build that need during the Lent season is through something called fasting. And what we do in fasting is we replace physical food with drawing near to Jesus who calls himself the bread of life. So prayer becomes our food during that time of fasting. And as our, our souls are strengthened, our bodies are physically weakened, it's a really beautiful dependence on the Lord that happens. Um, so here's what we're suggesting. Every Wednesday, we're going to, leading up to Easter, we're going to pray and fast as a church, all right? Um, now, listen, don't just not eat. Uh, this isn't like some cheat code Christian diet thing, okay? I want you to pray. All right, we're encouraging you to start with just one meal each Wednesday and just pray and let's see what God has for you. You can go uh, to our website, mercycharlotte.com slash fast, and you can find out kind of more, a little bit more teaching on that and kind of instruction on what we're doing. Uh, I can't wait to hear what God does in this through your life. Uh, and I know some of you have asked me, when are we going to have another prayer and worship night? Well, that's Good Friday, all right? Uh, we are going to worship and celebrate on Good Friday, so mark your calendar. All right. 1 Samuel 9 is where I want you to go today. And as I was reading and prepping for this week, I, I realized there's a question that I love asking people when we get to sit down together. I don't really get a lot of, like a lot of FaceTime one-on-one -on -one time with anybody outside of my family and my community group. So outside of that, you know, it's, it's pretty rare. So when I sit down with someone, I want to make the most of it. And so there's a question I love to ask, which is just really simple. What is God doing in your life right now? What's God doing in your life right now? And I, I love it because I get one of two answers, all right? There's one version of an answer that's a little bit longer, and it's like, man, well, here's what I've been learning in the Bible, or here's some circumstances and situations. Here's an answer to prayer. Here's something I'm really battling, a little bit full picture. And I love that because I can see your relationship with God through that. And I learn your story, and it's really good. But there's another answer um, that I get that's a lot more brief. It's brutally honest. And it's equally as true. I say, what's God doing in your life right now? And you say, I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to know. But if I'm honest, there feels like a huge gap between me living my life and understanding what in the world God is doing right now. And maybe you're just in that, asking that question, like, I'm not even sure God is real at all. And you're here at church because you're hoping for some confirmation even of that. I think today's scripture is going to be great for you. Because today's passage kind of puts into a, a scene that feeling when you are like at the farthest place possible from understanding what God is doing in your life. You ever have one of those moments where you're sitting in a situation and you just find yourself asking like, usually a little bit defeated, man, what am I even doing with my life? You know that feeling like, what am I even doing with my life? It's the absurdity and downright humility of the moment. It makes you kind of slump a little bit and be like, how far have I veered off of God's plan for my life. Surely this isn't God's plan for my life. This is not God's plan for anybody's life, right? God's like, no, no, go back three spaces. That's kind of the way you feel right there. I have, you know, recently, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, I was eating at Taco Bell. That's the whole illustration. Like, that's how far I was like, what am I doing <laughs> with my life? Really? End of illustration. You're expecting more. No. I'm like, I have a job. I'm 40. What am I doing with my life? Um, you've had those moments, though. 
what am I even doing? How did I get here? What's happening? Well, today we're going to meet the second of our three main figures in 1 Samuel. We're going to meet Saul. And he finds himself in the most what am I doing in my life situation. He's tracking down, unsuccessfully trying to track down lost donkeys in the middle of the wilderness. And it's in unsuccessfully chasing donkeys that he discovers God's destiny for him. My fun um, name for this sermon is Chasing Donkeys and Finding Destiny. I love it, okay? Um, I'm going to explain it more, but it's just, I, this is one of the ones, again, you know, I told you I studied this book um, months ago for a long period of time, and it was Saul's search. Because Saul ends up being, for the most part, a figure you don't want to emulate. Like, we're going to see, he kind of has a tragic fall. But here today, you'll see a little bit different, um, and I think there's a lot we can learn from it. So I'm going to try and show you why a guy chasing donkeys in the wilderness 3,000 years ago is applicable for your life, all right? Here's our main idea. We're going to see this come together as we watch this very strange, bizarre rise of Saul, okay? But here's your take home for today. I'll go ahead and put it out front. We follow God's unknowable plan by obeying his knowable word, all right? We follow his unknowable plan. We can follow it even though we can't know it, and we follow it by obeying his knowable word. I think you're going to find a lot of comfort and freedom in not knowing God's plan today, but I'm going to get a little ahead of myself. Here's the setup. I'm going to take about 15 minutes, eh, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, and I'm just going to walk us through chapters 9 through 11. I'm going to let the story unfold, observe some things I think are important for us along the way, kind of hit our key mile markers. Then I'm going to show you what Saul's rise to power, this search, and then his rise to power, what does this teach us about God's plan for us? Now, the, the scene is going to act, it's going to be like a, an, a play with three acts, all right? You're going to see Saul's private anointing where he gets anointed, but then his public confirmation and his first military victory, all right? And it all starts back in verse 1 of chapter 9. So the Bible's out. You can kind of move with me through this. I'm not going to read every single verse. I'll do some summarizing along the way. But we'll be, we'll be good, all right? Verse 1. You ready? Yeah. Let's go. There was a prominent man of Benjamin named Kish, son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, son of Aphiah, son of a ben Benjamite. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man. There was no one more impressive among the Israelites than he. He stood a head taller than anyone else. Now, the reason these details are in here, you got to know the bigger picture. Saul is being set up right here immediately as a contrast to their next king, King David. Today, Saul is a good guy. We'll see. But only, he's only being set up as a good guy so that we can see him fall really hard. He looks like the kind of king that Israel had demanded that we saw last week. Right? Last week, Israel demands a king from God. It's not good. God gives them over to that desire. They want a big, strong king. God gives them Saul. King David, who's going to be a good king, is actually just the opposite. He's going to be a small weakling. And what we're going to see in a couple of weeks is God say, listen, people look at the outward appearances. That's why they loved Saul so much. But God looks at the heart. This will be a really important lesson for us on following the Lord. But today, chapters 9 through 11, things go well for Saul. Next week, his troubles will come. Verse 3, one day, now whenever you see one day, I promise you, don't think of this as just random, all right? The Bible's intentionally saying one day to make it sound like any old day, but actually God had a plan in it all along. One day, the donkeys of Saul's father Kish wandered off. So Kish said to his son Saul, take one of the servants with you and go look for the donkeys. So Saul and his servant went through the, hill, through the hill country of Ephraim and then through the region of Shalisha, but they didn't find them. Then they went through the region of Shalim, nothing. They went through the Benjamite region, but still didn't find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, come on, let's, gonna, let's just go back. Or my father will stop worrying about the donkeys and start worrying about us. What am I even doing with my life? I'm out in the wilderness, and I can't even track down some donkeys. Let's go home. Dad's going to be worrying. Defeated, probably a little humiliated, because financially this is also going to hurt. 
what is happening? Well, the next few verses tell us the servant that was with him had heard about a man of God who lived nearby. That's Samuel. And he says, let's go ask Samuel, have you seen my donkeys? You know, imagine a little kid's book, all the different places. Have you seen my donkeys? Saul says, well, my mom told me always bring a gift when I go see somebody. So servant, you got anything to bring this guy? And he goes, well, I got a couple of pieces of silver. So let's go. Off they go. Go down to verse 15. They find their way to Samuel's house. Let's check this out. The day before Saul's arrival, the Lord had informed Samuel, at this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people, Israel. He will save them from the Philistines because I have seen the affliction of my people for their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here's the man I told you about. He will govern my people. Okay, listen up. Saul thought he was sent by his dad to find some donkeys. Was he? Yes. But who do you think sent the donkeys away? The donkeys didn't just all of a sudden get an adventurous spirit. Okay? No, why do you, th- why do you think that it put that, that Saul was the one that the father said, hey, I want Saul to go? It's because God had already said to Samuel, I'm going to send you a man. And then the Lord said, see, I told you. That tall farmer walking through all frustrated, that's the one. He has no idea what's going on, but he's the one. Look at verse 18. Saul approached Samuel in the city gate and asked, would you please tell me where the seer's house is? Y'all, Samuel is the national prophet of Israel. For Saul to not know who this guy is, it's a bit, it just shows you how removed and remote this guy is, right, from the happenings of Israel. Verse 19, I am the seer, Samuel answered. Go up ahead of me to the high place and eat with me today. When I send you off in the morning, I'll tell you everything that's in your heart. As for the donkeys that wandered, um, Saul has not asked about the donkeys yet. As for the donkeys that wandered away from you three days ago, don't worry about them because they have been found. And who does all Israel desire but you and all your father's family? (laughs) This is a mind-melting moment for Saul. He looks over his shoulder. Are you you talking to me? I mean, I, I heard you say donkeys, and I doubt there are other people searching for donkeys right now. But I'm not desirable. That's what Saul's thinking. And above all that, a three-day donkey hunt does not make one smell desirable, right? Verse 21, Saul responded, am I not a Benjaminite from the smallest of Israel's tribes? And isn't my clan the least important of all the clans of the Benjaminite tribe? Why have you said something like this to me? Nobody desires my tribe. Because that's the tribe who the other tribes joined up against to go to war against and almost wiped them out entirely. They were the smallest tribe left. But who does Israel desire? Really anybody else but their tribe. But Samuel insisted. And you keep reading, and he sits Saul down at a table with 30 men that he had already invited to dinner. He pulled out the best portion of the meat. It's the thigh meat. And it's the best portion that he reserves for him, and he serves it to him. And this is symbolic. This dinner where Saul's at the head of the table is symbolic of what's going to happen the next day. Saul is the chosen one. Can you imagine? Lays his head down that night as Samuel's honored guest. I don't know what is happening. Well, the next morning, Samuel calls Saul up on the roof. Here's what happens. Look at chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Samuel takes the flask of oil just as God had instructed him to, poured it out on Saul's head, kissed him and said, hasn't the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? Israel is the Lord's inheritance. And anointing in this case is the way of symbolically setting somebody aside. That's what this does. You set them aside for God's assignment. The Lord has set aside Saul, of all people, as king, as ruler over Israel. And to confirm this, To confirm this is not some crazy talk of an old man, Samuel says you're going to see a couple of things happen on your journey back home. A couple of guys at Rachel's grave are going to tell you what happened to your donkeys as you pass by that landmarker. And then there are going to be three guys at the Oak of Tabor. They're going to give you some food. And then when you get to your hometown, there are going to be some prophets, traveling prophets with some killer entrance music. I'm telling you, read it. You'll see it. You're going to start prophesying with them. What? Well, you read and you see it all happened. It all happened. And it's so crazy that 
Saul is the one that it happened to that the scripture says right in the middle of there is a summary. A new saying developed in the land that was, is Saul also among the prophets? Kind of like, eh, it could happen. I mean, anything could happen. After all, Saul is among the prophets. And if that can happen, anything can happen. And it finishes this sort of act one, if you will, with Saul's anointing. Again, it's a private anointing. It's him and Samuel, but it's this anointing as king. It ends with kind of this hilarious conversation between Saul and his uncle that sounds like Saul is a teenage boy. Look, verse 14. Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, this is after they get back home, where'd you go? To look for the donkeys, Saul answered. When we saw they weren't there, we went to Samuel. Well, tell me, Saul's uncle asked. What did Samuel say to you? Saul told him, he assured us the donkeys had been found. The end. Like, that's all he said. All this other stuff happens. And he just goes, it's fine. It's good. You know, he told us the donkeys had been found. And sure enough, here they are. Right? Saul did not tell him what Samuel had said about the matter of kingship. And that matters a lot that he didn't let anybody else know because of what happens next. Saul's back in his bed at home after the craziest week ever. What seemed like chasing donkeys into the middle of nowhere was actually the path God had laid out for him to put him in the middle of everything. And from there, the scene shifts, act two, if you will, to his public confirmation. And it would have been nice for Saul to have told his family what had happened as they get ready for this moment. Samuel pulls all the tribes of Israel together and reminds them what is about to happen. He says, this, we're going to find your king And the king you get is because you rejected God as king. Reminds them, this is not a good thing, but your God is gracious. Foreshadowing that whoever gets selected, it's probably not going to end well because they were to look to God as their king. Rebellion never ends well. But again, that's in a a week or two for us. Verse 17, Samuel summoned the people to the Lord at Mizpah. And said to the Israelites, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you. I brought Israel out of Egypt. I rescued you from the power of the Egyptians and all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God. I mean, think about it. The anointing of a new king, the confirmation of a new king is a rejection of God as their king. That's what he's been saying. You've rejected your God, the one who saves you from all your troubles and afflictions. You said to him, you must set a king over us. Now, therefore... Present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. So they cast lots. That's what's going to happen here. They cast lots. Without getting into explaining lots too much, think of there are 12 tribes. Think you got two dice. Each dice has, you know, a number on it, one through six. You roll it, right? So then each of the 12 tribes has a number, all right? Again, it's not exactly what it is, but basically that's how they identify which tribe God has selected, okay? Um, The idea is that it's purely random in terms of man's ability to control it. It puts everything in God's hands, leaves no room for man's meddling, which reinforces our whole point that what seems random and uncontrollable is actually God's plan all along. Okay, verse 20. Samuel had all the tribes of Israel come forward. The tribe of Benjamin was selected. You can see Saul start to sweat immediately, right? Then he had the tribe of Benjamin come forward by its clans, and the Matrite clan was selected. Finally, Saul... Son of Kish was selected, but when they searched for him, the guy who's a head taller than everybody else, they can't find him because he's hiding. There's an intentional thing that our author is doing is making Saul sound like the lost donkeys. Now who is stubborn and lost, right? Yet again, they inquired of the Lord, has the man come here yet? And I don't know how all this worked out, but this is a great moment. The Lord replied, there he is, hidden among the supplies. He's trying to hide. He's right over there. Saul is hiding from the Lord's assignment on his life. We're not sure why. It's likely fear. He's a farmer. Now he's going to lead all of Israel. It's frightening. It's overwhelming. But his shrinking back from what God calls him to do is also going to be an omen of what would come in his life. Verse 23, they ran and they got him from there. When he stood among the people, he stood a head taller than anyone else. Samuel said to all the people, do you see the one the Lord has chosen? And he says it again. There is no one like him among the entire population. This is a reminder that this is the kind of king y'all want. Tall Saul. Remember what we said last week. 
Just because God gives it to you does not mean he's endorsing your desire. He may be allowing your desire to come to fruition to your own peril. Israel's response should sound a little bit ominous to us. And the people shouted, long live the king. The wrong king. Y'all, there's a shadow forming over Israel, but it's just a, it's a small cloud in the distance right now. The trouble will come. Samuel proclaimed, verse 25, to the people the rights of the kingship. He wrote them on a scroll, which he placed in the presence of the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people home. Now, that little note right there is actually very important. God gave them a king, but he gave the king some boundaries. This is different than what we saw last week with Samuel's warning of he will take, he can take, he will take, he can take. This was a warning to the king about how the king, the authority that the king has to submit to. Even the king submits to an authority. You catch that? For Saul, this is big because it's been a wild week of what in the world is happening, right? Chasing donkeys to finding destiny. And now he's told, even here on the throne, you have an authority over you. You submit to God's word because even the king in Israel, even the king submits to God. That brings us to chapter 11, our third movement in today's narrative. Saul's been anointed as king now, publicly chosen, and given an authority that he has to reign under, even as he reigns over Israel. And now we get back to the reason Israel wanted this king to begin with. There's an enemy knocking at the door, and they are scared. Because it's a real, this is a serious enemy. This is Nahash the Ammonite. He's so scary, the border people of Israel, as soon as he shows up, just goes, we surrender. They just immediately, we surrender. Let's not fight. Let's talk terms, Nahash. And Nahash goes, okay, I'll let you live, but I get to gouge out every single one of your right eyes because I want to humiliate you. Seriously, that's what he says. And so they reply, can we have a week to think on that, right? <laughs> Which makes sense to me. So they send out messengers. Somebody help. And Nahash is like, so overconfident. He's like, sure, you can have a week. Go ahead. I know what's coming. Well, Saul is back home farming, hasn't been coronated yet, just chosen. He's coming in from his field when he hears the news. This is verse 6, chapter 11. When Saul heard these words, the Spirit of God suddenly came powerfully on him, and his anger burned furiously. He took a team of oxen, cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout the territory of Israel by messengers, who said... This is what will be done to the ox of anyone who doesn't march behind Saul and Samuel. As a result, the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they went out united. Yeah. All right, this is to remind us, actually, what's happening here is it's, it's to hearken us back to the time of the judges that happened just before this. The only other person the Spirit of God rushes on like this is Samson. This hacking the ox to pieces and mailing it out to the far corners of the kingdom is to remind us the very last thing that came out of Saul's hometown. Gibeah is mentioned in Judges 19 through 21. A man and his concubine, like a wife, but she's property at the time, are traveling home after they've reconciled. She'd been unfaithful to him and fled, but he went to bring her home lovingly, and on the way back, they stay in Gibeah. They're attacked. She is raped and killed and left dead on a doorstep. The next day, that man cuts her into 12 pieces and sends her throughout Israel. That's what rallies the tribes of Israel against Benjamin, against Gibeah. Well, now the Spirit of God is redeeming that memory and saying, instead of debauchery coming out of Gibeah, salvation is coming out of Gibeah. But still, if you get mail from Gibeah, don't open it, okay? <laughs> um, the threat works. A really large army is assembled, and they go to work. Verse 11, the next day... Saul organized troops into three divisions. That's to remind us of Gideon from the judges. I'm telling you, um, the Bible is awesome how it's all connected, telling one story. During, during the morning watch, they invaded the Ammonite camp and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. There were survivors, but they were so scattered that no two of them were left together. And so the people celebrate. They get to keep their eyes. They get to keep their land. Verse 12, after the people said to Samuel, who said that Saul should not reign over us? Because there were some that, you know, doubted. Give us those men who doubted so we can kill them. And Saul said, no. No one will be executed this day, for the Lord has provided deliverance in Israel. So they go to Gilgal. That's how the scene winds down. 
It's a sacred site in Israel. This is where Joshua had put an Ebenezer stone after they had crossed through the Jordan River on dry ground because the Lord parted the water. That was in Gilgal. And now Samuel leads them in a coronation, but he calls it a renewing of the kingship. Why? Because even as they coronate Saul, the first king, well, how are we renewing? It's because Samuel wants them to actually renew their allegiance to God as their true king. We'll talk about that more in a minute. So here we sit. A short while after farmer Saul stood frustrated in the wilderness chasing donkeys, now he's a victorious king over all of Israel. It's wild and, and strange. So let me answer the question, how in the world does this help us today? I want to give you three things you can learn about God's plan from Saul's very strange rise to power, okay? Three things I want you to know about God's plan from this strange rise to power. Here's the first one. God is working in your life right now. Y'all, this is so simple that I spent so much time this week trying to figure out a clever way to say this. But then I realized sometimes we just need to be reminded and encouraged with a simple truth. Maybe this is new to you because you're new to the Bible and new to church. This truth is absolutely central to the Christian faith. We believe there is a God who created the world and everything in it. And he didn't just set it in motion and then step back and let it roll like a divine clockmaker. No, we believe he not only put it all together, but that he actively governs our world here and now in this very moment. This is Colossians 1.17. All things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things and what else? By him, all things hold together. He's actively holding things together. Ephesians 1, in him we've received an inheritance in Jesus because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who does what? Who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. He's the one actively working it out. What I'm trying to say is that our God is a hands-on God. He's here working. And his providence, it's not just big picture what's happening in our world. It's focused on you. And some of you need that hope today. The way Jesus says it, he says, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So don't be afraid. The fruit of that is don't fear. You're worth more than many sparrows. If he goes to the trouble to oversee the sparrow's life, certainly he'll care for you. So if you feel frustrated right now, like you're out in the wilderness chasing donkeys, I want to encourage you that your heavenly father sees you. He sees you. He's working in your life right now. He knows where the donkeys are, and he's already taken care of that. And I don't know what he has for you, but I know he knows. And not only does he know, he is actively right now loving you in this moment where it feels like wilderness. Like a father, he's saying, I've got you. I've got you out here in the wilderness where you have nowhere else to turn but me. I've got you. I know for some of you, those donkeys are your grown kids. They are being a real stubborn donkey right now. <laughs> Y'all could have had a lot of fun with this if I'd have used the KJV, but I didn't, okay? Um, <laughs> that's right. But look, I need you to know when it comes to those grown kids, God is working in their life. You need to keep praying, and you need to keep giving them over to God. Some of you have friends, siblings, parents. They're in that same boat, and you need to do the same thing. Give them over to God. Some of you are chasing career dreams or healing in your marriage or, or whatever, and I just need you to know God is working in the search. He's taking you somewhere, and according to Romans 8, for those of us in Christ, he is working all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I've got a real desire to talk to those of you that are searching right now. You may, maybe you're like, Saul, you cannot believe that you are in church today. Of all places, you wandered in here because your friend said, hey, before we go home, let's try church, right? Maybe God can help. And I guess in that space, my job is like Samuel to say, we've been expecting you. In fact, there's a table that God has prepared for you. In fact, the table is so central to God's relationship with you. It's a table where like Saul's table, it is filled with others around it that are in God's kingdom. Jesus sat down at a table with his disciples. He invites you to that table. You don't sit at the head of it though. You couldn't handle that throne. You can't handle the throne of your own life, let alone God's kingdom. 
at the head sits the true and good king. And he says to his disciples, and he extends the offer to you that the murmurings of your soul are actually the echoes of reality. And eternity really is real. God is real. He has something for you. You thought you were wandering, but you were really just making your way to his table to sit with him. You got to sit under his authority, though, because he's the king, not you. The king calls for your surrender to trust him. C.S. Lewis likened it. uh, He likened becoming a Christian to a soldier coming before a conquering king and laying down his weapons and saying, I surrender and I'm your servant. But then discovering that the king picks you up as you kneel and says, welcome home, son or daughter. You were made for this kingdom. Listen, here's the second thing I want to tell you. You follow God's unknowable plan by following his noble word and God is gracious. And God is gracious. See, there's no way Saul is going to know how to be a king. Even with his instruct, now he's got some instructions, but man, he's going to mess up. And God is gracious. There's no way Saul knew what a king should do next. Even Saul's given authority, God's word written down for him to obey. And there's a foreshadow in that too, that when Saul's spirit wants to take from the people, he is bound under the authority of God's word to bless them. And God in his kindness has given you his word. You can't know the future. You're not meant to know the future. You wouldn't believe it, Habakkuk says. You would not believe it even if you were told. And if you were told, you know what you're trying to do? Control it, (laughs) which would just mess it up. God has intentionally created a gap between his knowledge and yours. And you can't know what's going to happen next. And that right there is either going to stir fear or courage. So I'll offer you Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart, do not rely on your own understanding and all your ways know him. He'll make your path straight. The application step today is to obey the God that's working in your life. In this kindness, he's given you his word, his guide for flourishing in this world. And when you obey his word while not knowing what's going to happen, that right there is called faith. That's what faith is. I'll follow him. He will work it out. So to the high school or college student who's working a part-time minimum wage job, when you're making scraps, doing menial labor, what does God's word say when it feels like, what am I doing with my life? It's 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, whether you eat, sleep, or anything else that you do, do it all to the glory of God. So fold the shirt, make the fries, watch the kids, shovel the horse manure at the farm you work at, wash the golf cart at the course you work at to the glory of God. And trust it as you give your best to that job. Then you come home and you do your homework because you want to give glory to God in your schoolwork. And then you do your chores because you want to honor your father and your mother to the glory of God. And you do all that, you understand, man, even when I feel like what is happening in my life, God is working in that. He's got a plan. He's doing something in you and through you. And you're following his plan by following his word. And like the psalmist says, Because that's true. You can lay your head down at night and sleep and rest because the Lord sustains you. you, To you single adults who are, some of you are are waiting and maybe dating right now feels like searching in the wilderness. And I promise you, should you find it, it'll be a donkey. No, I'm playing. Um, That's that's a stretch of the the story. That's not applicable. Um, But the search nonetheless, I just want you to, I want you to hear that God loves you and that pursuit The pursuit can turn into an idol and thereby it can be wrong. But the pursuit itself, the desire for a spouse is not wrong. It's good. And God is working. He sees you and he loves you. And right now he's working in the waiting. Parents of young kids, as the monotony of diapers and discipline and lack of sleep and all that. Now, I'll never forget. I think it was our third. Yeah, it was my first daughter, our third kid. It was, you know, one day I'm just changing what has to be the 60,000th diaper, you know. It's like the mileage meter trips over, and it's like, am I still doing this? I'm um, changing this poopy diaper, and I'm sleep-deprived, and I'm like, all right, you know, to the glory of God, here we go again, you know? There is a selflessness that's happening in that moment that God is cultivating in you. God is working, and he's gracious. As you try to obey his word and fail again and again, and you return back to him, God is working. Here's the last thing I want to tell you. Jesus is the true Savior King. Listen, you need to know there is a real enemy out there who wants to do more than gouge out your right eye. He wants to take your very soul for all eternity. 
You think Nahash the Ammonite is bad? <laughs> He's just a man. There is an enemy, the devil, who is out to devour you. 1 Peter 5, be sober-minded and alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. And I think this is the hard part of Christianity for some of y'all to believe. God seems feasible, feasible, but the devil seems mythical. And I want to ask you, have you ever wondered why that is? Why it seems so hard to believe in a real ruler of an evil realm who is out to harm you? who commands demons to take you down? Well, perhaps if we believe strongly in such a being, we would become more dependent on God, and that enemy doesn't want that. I think our cynicism towards the supernatural is the great lie multiple generations of Christians have bought into. Because you only need a hero if there's a villain. Take away the villain who needs the hero. Some of you need, this is a strange prayer, a prayer of confession. You need to confess to God your lack of belief in the devil. It's a weird prayer, but God's word says he's real, and you function like he isn't. Or if you think that he is, you function like you're strong enough to handle him on your own. This villain, though, you can't defeat him. I've told you several times in this narrative, as we go through it, you'll be tempted to put yourself into the shoes permanently of Samuel, Saul, or David. And it's good to sit in there for a minute. We've done that today to learn a little bit. But overall, we are not any of them. We are helpless Israel. The people of God, prone to rebel against him, but who he graciously saves for the sake of his glory. And God in his grace goes out to battle against this enemy, goes up to the cross to pay for your sin and mine, goes into the grave to battle death itself, and comes out victorious. And Revelation says at the end of all days, he will bring a final victory over the devil. And guess where we will share in the victory celebration? It'll be in God's throne room around a table. The beauty of the gospel is that God was expecting you. I want to welcome you home today. Today, receive the good news of the kingdom of God, sinners and saints alike. Sit back down and rest at the table. Psalm 23, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Jesus gathered with his disciples and taught them about the kingdom where? Around the table. Where is the place that God has prepared for you to spend eternity worshiping him in victory, it's around his table. That's where we're going to gather in heaven. And the invitation to come and sit at his table is for you today. And I want to lead you in a response to that. If you would, bow your head and pray. Let me lead you in a time of prayer. Our worship teams will be getting in place at both of our campuses. I want you to respond to the Lord with whatever he may be convicting you of. Some of you have been wandering and you've been mad at God. And what you need to do today is just simply say, God, I believe that you're working. You need to give that struggle, that search, whatever that is, back over to him and trust him again. Instead of being angry with him, you need to trust him. And you need to thank him for his grace in your life. For those of you that are Christians, go back to your time where you gave your life to Christ, where you received salvation. And recognize that if he was working there, surely he's working now. He didn't go up on the cross for you and then forget about you. He's working now. You need to thank him for that. And if you're not a Christian, I invite you to receive the invitation to God's table today. He sits at the head of it. And he says he sent his son Jesus to pay the price for your sin. To fight the battle against the enemy on your behalf. And if you will confess your sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive you of that sin. His blood on the cross has paid for your sin. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what his word says to you. Would you confess your sin? Confess he is Lord. I believe that he paid for my sin. And I believe he got out of the grave. And tell him, thank you, God for saving me. God, thank you for your grace. May we be a people submitted to your word joyfully with the warning of Israel who continued to defy you. God, would that pull our hearts back to you as our loving, good king. We submit to your word joyfully. Thank you, Father, for the celebration we get of that in baptism today. God, I pray that you would continue to refine us, though, 
as your people under your leadership. May we celebrate you as our right and good king. May we be thankful when we believe, even in those strange moments, you are working now and you are our good king. We love you. We give you our praise to your glory.